Welcome to it, this is part two of grading S-Log3 footage inside of DaVinci Resolve. The grading that I'm talking about here can be used for pretty much any type of footage because the fundamentals of this color grade will work for you as well. So all we're doing that's different from part one is we're just building on that basic node tree structure that I always use. I've got the computer right in front of me here. So if you see me looking down, that's only because I'm doing this color grade live for you right now. In today's episode, we're going to be covering noise reduction, exposure, white balance, highlight control, power windows, skin tone adjustment, color space transform, working with a creative LUT, working Working with the luminance versus saturation slider and adding the very subtle but effective glow effect. There's a lot to get through today, so let's get into it. Before you start off with your color grade, always make sure that your project settings are set up correctly for your camera platform. Now, if you want to know what my settings are, just go into the description of this video and I'll lay it out there in very simple terms how you go about doing that. First off, you wanna go ahead and create your first node. I'm holding down Alt and S on my MacBook Pro. And in this node, I'm going to label it CST for color space transform. I click on the FX tab, color space transform. I drag it onto the node. Then I'm gonna come over here to input color space. I'm going to set it to sgamut 3cine Input gamma is slog3. Then I'm gonna set the output color space to rec709. And we set the output gamma, rec709a for Mac. Rec 709 Gamma 2.4 for Windows. Then I'm going to drag it to the end of my node tree. I'm going to create another node. I'm going to label this Creative LUT. And this is where our Creative LUT is going to go. Then I'm going to leave these two nodes here at the end of the node tree. And I'm going to do all of my grading prior to this Rec 709 conversion and Creative LUT. The reason why I want to grade prior to the CST and Creative LUT node is because the CST and Creative LUT converts your footage to Rec 709. And I wanna work with that full S-Log3 10-bit color depth that the Sony provides to me. So I'm going to do all of the grading prior to these two nodes, because in those two nodes, that's where that signal, all those colors are getting clamped into Rec 709. Then I'm going to right click on the CST node, go to add node, add serial before. I'm going to drag this node right to the beginning of the node tree and I'm going to label it in R. Then I go to motion effects, I go straight to spatial threshold. Then I de-link Luma and Chroma so I can control their values independent of each other. I set Luma to five and Chroma to 12. By me doing noise reduction at the beginning of the node tree, I am reducing that digital noise without sacrificing the detail. A lot of people like to do their noise reduction at the end and some people may argue with me, but I've been doing it like this for years and it's worked really well for me. Next, we're going to add a new node and we are going to label it EXP. Then I'm gonna come down here to the curves tab and I grab this top right hand side of the curve which represents the highlights and I drag downward. Whilst I drag downwards, I keep my eyes on the waveform monitor and I set the ceiling to my highlights to around 896. And I add in a soft S curve here by adjusting the midtones and the shadows. Bringing down the highlights to 896 is a method that a lot of colorists use to control exposure and preserve dynamic range, giving it a more filmic and cinematic tone. Next, I create a new node and I label this WB for white balance. I then come over here to the primaries tab. I select the white balance picker and I pick a neutral object on our still frame here, which is the artist's white shirt. As soon as I click on his white shirt, we are essentially telling DaVinci Resolve, this is the color white, please adjust the white balance according to my white balance sort of selection. And as you can see there, it's done a really good job. The automatic functionality of DaVinci Resolve is great, but sometimes you need to go in there and do a bit of manual adjustment by not only just relying on DaVinci Resolve, but you gotta trust your eye as well. I can't express to you how important setting your white balance is. White balance really defines how all the other colors in your image respond to your color grading. So getting this right early is essential for clean tones. 
Next, I'm going to create a new node and I'm gonna label this HL for highlight. I'm then going to come down here to the qualifier tab. I'm going to deselect hue and saturation and we're only going to be using luminance, which stands for the brightness. I want to, in this node, select the brightest parts of the image and I wanna bring them down a touch, all whilst watching that waveform and trying to get those highlights to either on or just below that 896 highlight line on the waveform. So come over here to the picker and we're going to select the brightest part of the image. Once again, it's the shirt. I take the picker and I drag over the shirt. And as we drag across this white shirt, we can see our luminance control has changed. A selection has taken place, but we cannot see what that selection is. So what you have to do is click on the highlight tool just above the monitor and that shows you what selection has been made. It's done a pretty good job, but we have to refine this. How we do that is by coming down here into matte finesse. I'm going to denoise the selection, blur it up, and I'm gonna go over to clean black and pull across to the right hand side. Great stuff. Now that we've made our selection, we've essentially told DaVinci Resolve, these are the areas of the image we want to affect. But now we have to put the effect in place. And that effect is to pull those highlights down. So go into the color wheels tab, go to the gain color wheel. Gain stands for highlights and pull left on this toggle wheel here to lower those highlights. Take a look at the waveform and see how only the brightest parts of the image are being dragged downward. That's settling really nice on that 896 line and I'm happy with that. By targeting these highlights, we are bringing about balance to the image and we stop those brightest parts of the image from being overexposed and keeps the image soft, clean, and easy on the eye. Next, we're going to create a new node and we are going to label it PW. In this node, we are going to direct our viewer's attention in towards the subject because he's the most important part of this specific frame. Next, we're going to come down here to the window tab and we're going to add a circle. We're gonna place this over the subject's face. We're gonna hold down on this red toggle here and drag outward. And that just smooths out that power window, that selection. So when we place the effect on the power window, the main concentration of that effect will be in the center of the power window and then it will be feathered out. So it won't be as strong towards the outsides of that power window. Next, I'm going to come over here to the curves tab. I'm going to select the middle part of this curve and that represents the mid-tones. And I'm gonna drag it up. And as you can see there, it's just brought up the exposure ever so slightly on the subject's face, helping him stand out from the background just a little bit. Next, I come over here to the blur tab and I go across to radius, which is for sharpening or blur. And I'm gonna drag down on this toggle over here ever so slightly to 48. What we have now done is we have sharpened the most inner part of that power window. Now though, I want to take this a step further by darkening the edges around the power window and adding a slight blur. And how we do that is by right clicking on this main power window, going down to add node and add outside. This node is going to affect only the areas on the outside of this main power window. So once again, come over here to the curves tab. I'm going to go to the midtones by selecting a point in the middle of the curve and dragging downwards. Excellent. Then I'm going to come over here into the blur tab, once again, across to radius. And this time around, instead of sharpening this part of the, the image, we are going to add a bit of a blur. I do this by dragging upward on this toggle to 52. And there we go. That's before and after looking really, really good. But once we've done our power window, we want that power window to follow our subject as he moves within the frame. Come down here to the tracker and click on forward and reverse. And you can see there DaVinci Resolve has done a really great job at tracking our subject as the frame moves along. Now, create a new node and in this node we're going to label it skin and we're going to do all of our skin tone adjustments. And first we need to tell DaVinci Resolve where exactly the skin tones are. So we come down here to the qualifier tab, select the picker over here and we drag over skin tones. Once again, we can't see what selection has been made by DaVinci Resolve. So you got to click on that highlight tool just above the monitor. And now we can see that DaVinci Resolve has done a pretty good job of making a selection, but it selected some areas that are just not necessary at all. So what we got to do is refine that selection. And we do this by adjusting what colors 
what hues have been selected, what saturation, what luminance, and then we go into matte finesse and we do pretty much the same things. Starting out with denoise, blur, and clean black. And there we go. Now that we've told DaVinci Resolve which areas of the image we want to fix, we're going to make adjustments to only those areas which are the skin tones. And how we do that is we're going to come here into the primaries tab and we're going to head over to midtone detail. And for that music video sort of commercial look, we need to soften those skin tones. We want to give it a really soft and polished look. And how I'm going to do that is by removing midtone detail by dragging on this toggle wheel here to the left. I like to have it generally at about minus 12.5. Then what we do is come over here to the vector scope and as you can see not much is going on here but as soon as I deselect the highlight tool what you'll see is that there are a lot more colors and that's because the vector scope is showing us the saturation levels of all the different colors that are coming from this image but we only want to focus in on where the skin tones are lying on the vector scope that's super important. So how do you see where only the skin tones are lying? Well we just have to click on this highlight tool again and then you'll see where the skin tones are represented by this little blob over here on the vector scope. But it's not very clear to us. So what we need to do is come over here to settings and we select show two times. And when you do that, those colors just get a little bit larger so it's easier, it's more clear to see. Then just under show two times, there's also a toggle for show skin tone indicator. And when you click on that, a line is represented on this vector scope. And this line represents a universal line for where all skin tones should be lying to look the most alive and the most natural and real, I guess. It's essentially giving us a reference and we want our skin tones to be right on that line to be accurate. So how do we get our skin tones to lie perfectly on that skin tone line indicator? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If you look very closely at the vector scope, you can see that the skin tones are slightly off to the left hand side. And if you look at your color wheels, you can see that it's lying off to the yellowy green side of the skin tone line indicator. So how do we cancel out those yellowish green tones? Well, we've got to add in the opposite color. And if you look at your color wheel, the opposite to greeny yellow is magenta. So all you have to do is come over here to the primaries tab, go to gamma, which stands for midtones. Skin tones always lie in the gamma or the midtones. What we then do is hold on this middle toggle wheel here in the gamma on the color wheel. And we're just going to drag it off to the right very, very slightly, all whilst watching the vector scope. And as you can see, we've got our skin tones lying on the skin tone line indicator perfectly. And I'm very happy with this. Here we go, before the adjustment, you can see the skin tones are a little bit green. And after the adjustment, we've just given the skin tones a lot more life. Once the skin tone adjustment is done, this is the fun part. This is where we add in our creative touch. Now that we've adjusted our skin tones, we've got the following node, which is the CST, which we did right at the beginning of this tutorial. Now we're going to add in our creative LUT. Obviously, I'm going to be using my own LUT for this, but you can use any LUT that you want to, to get a creative look out of this. So here we go. I'm going to right click on this creative LUT node, go down to LUTs, and I'm going to select my LUT. And when you do that, you can see it looks, it looks pretty cool, but it's pretty intense. It's a little bit overboard for my liking. And how are we going to fix that is bring down the intensity of that creative LUT. We do this by going into the key tab, going to key output, drag it down all the way to zero. And as you can see now, there's absolutely no effect being had by this creative LUT. And then I slowly drag this key output to the right hand side and I boost that intensity until I feel like it's getting into the right place. You can see already it's really starting to look good. There we go, I'm happy with that. So 70% intensity, lights off and on, boom. Right, moving on to the next step, which is my Pro Mist effect. If you don't know, you can actually buy a filter called the Promus filter. And what this filter does is it softens your highlights, blooms the highlights, gives it a very filmic aesthetic. And it's lovely, but the thing is, I've become so reliant on doing it in post-production here in DaVinci Resolve just because it's so good. I don't even film with a Promus filter anymore. So what we need to do is create a new node. We're going to label it GLO for glow. Then we come over here to the top right hand side of DaVinci Resolve, we go into the effects tab and we search for the glow effect. Once we find it, we drag that glow effect onto the node. Then we go into the settings of this desired effect and we're going to make 
a couple of changes to get this effect to work in our favor. As you can see, straight out of the box, it's pretty intense. And if that's the look you like, then that's great. Go ahead with, with the default settings, but I like to finesse it a bit. And these are my exact settings. The first thing I do is come over here into composite mode. I set that to screen. Next, I go to shine threshold. I set that to 0.8 Then I go to gain 0.3, spread 0.3, and then saturation, I put in 0.8. There we go. It's a very slight effect for me. That's the way I like it. Very subtle. If you want it more intense, obviously you just play with those numbers. At the end of the day, in DaVinci Resolve, we are doing so many things throughout these serial nodes that when you compound them all together, it gives off a massive effect. And by going a little bit too overboard every single node, when, once all those nodes are compounded, it's just not gonna have a pleasing effect. One more node, we're going to label this LVS, which stands for Luma versus Saturation, Brightness versus Saturation. And what we're going to do in this node is we are going to prevent oversaturation, especially in our shadows and in our highlights. And I must be honest with you, I don't remember where I learned this technique, but I have used it for a number of years. It helps me get a very clean filmic image. By pulling down that saturation in your shadows and your highlights, you ensure that your darkest parts of the image are clean black and your brightest parts of the image are clean white, which is super important and accurate as far as I'm concerned. So what we need to do in this node is we come over here to the curves tab and we go through these icons here until we find Luma versus saturation. Then what I do is I click on the black toggle here and the white toggle over here and you can see it already creates points for me. And then what I do is I go into the shadows represented on the far left hand side and I pull down on this toggle all the way to the bottom, essentially making the darkest parts of this image true black. Then I come over here to the right hand side, which represents the highlights. I also drag that down, ensuring that the highlights are true white with a gradual sort of increase into saturation. And once you've done that, your color grade is done. Here's before and after. I applied this grade to the other clips within the sequence, even the sequence shot at the end of the day. When the sun was at its lowest and the color temperature was vastly different. All I had to do there to make sure that it matched with the rest of the shots in my sequence is play around a little bit with the white balance. If you wanna get a hold of this footage that I'm using in this tutorial, let me know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. If you didn't, it's cool, you can just bounce. Until next time, cheers.